Hello, I'm Annette Young and welcome to the 51 Centre, a show about women reshaping our world. Coming up, we head to Iraq where the sudden deaths of four well-known women is sparking fears that a campaign is underway to silence those who dare to speak out. And staying in the region, we meet Dr Suad al-Lawati, the first female vice chair of Amman State Council. This as record numbers of women are entering university and the workforce in the Gulf nation. Also, what happens when both mum and dad are professional sailors and are competing in the same race against each other? But we begin in Iraq, which has been rocked by the deaths of four prominent women within a month. They appear to be targeted attacks against outspoken individuals, including a human rights activist and a well-known Instagram model. Some Iraqis worry that the killings aim to silence women. Our team on the ground sent us this report. The mysterious September deaths of successful beauty salon owners Rasha Al-Hassan and Rafi Falyaseri were just a week apart. Then came the violent shootings of Instagram model Tara Faris and activist Suad Al-Ali. For some Iraqis, the four killings are part of a systematic effort to punish women for pushing the boundaries of the country's conservative society. The deaths have been the talk of the Baghdad University campus, where this student says some groups in Iraq perceive successful women as a threat. For women in Iraq, it isn't easy because the Iraqi woman is primarily a housewife. Most importantly, she must take care of the children and the house, and when her husband comes back from work, she must take care of him. In the meantime, Rasha's family is in mourning. On September 20th, the 34-year-old esthetician lost consciousness and later died in hospital. Her loved ones are still waiting for the autopsy results. After 10 days, they told us to wait for two more weeks. And after the two weeks passed, they told us to come back two months later. I don't know the reasons for this delay, but it made us suspicious of all kinds of things. Rasha died just one week after Rafif, the high-profile owner of a competing beauty salon. Before her death, Rasha had texted her husband that she feared she would be next. She sent me a message, Mutaz, I'm afraid of death. I feel that death is very near. Iraqi society wasn't always this dangerous for women. During the 1970s and 80s, women in Iraq enjoyed relative social freedom. Women's rights activist Dalal al-Rubayi remembers a time when most women in Iraq didn't wear the veil. In the old days, we all dressed like this. It was normal. Today, you can only wear this when it's a women's only party. But on your way to the event, you have to wear something to cover yourself. When we go to a mixed event, it's totally forbidden to show our skin. Until 2003, Saddam Hussein's secular dictatorship had kept a lid on conservative religious groups that could challenge his rule. The American invasion, claiming to bring democratic values, instead opened the doors for religious hardliners to seize control of the Iraqi state. The latest deaths have further intimidated young women and worried activists that Iraqi women will continue to struggle to claim their rightful place in society. And staying in the Middle East, and this time heading to Amman. Dr. Suad Alawati is the vice chair of the State Council, the upper house of the Amman parliament. She's the first woman in the job and currently visiting Paris. Thank you so much for your time. First of all, I just want to ask you, how many women are there in the upper council at this point? We have a 17%. So the women are from different sectors in Oman. And in the lower house of parliament, what's the figures like there? It's just one woman. Oh, I see. <laughs> But it must be hard where historically women have had a very limited role, if at all, publicly, especially in a traditional conservative society uh, that you see in Amman. So as a result, is it difficult doing your job? I guess um, I had the opportunity to nominate myself to reach to that position and actually the counselling members who chose me and nominated me to be a duty chairperson of state council. Was it difficult to get their support, being a woman? <clears throat> no, it wasn't actually. And um, 
for that, I think even in the Shura Council, which is the uh, uh, lower house, as you mentioned, but we see it equally in Oman. I think maybe in the coming election, which will be in 2019, I hope there will be more women then. Uh, do you get the sense that there are more women in Oman who are ready to enter political life, that there's a definite upswing of interest in entering politics? I think in Shura Council, yes. But the problem is with the women, when they try one time and they fail, they don't go and try it again. I think for these positions, uh, you need to be persistent and you have to try several times. And I think the success will be there. It certainly is the case that more and more women are entering university. They're also entering the workforce in your country. For instance, I think one third of government employees uh, in Oman are female. So how is this impacting modern society? Actually, it's more than that. Uh, the new statistics for 2017, it's 42% of the government workforce are women who are working. And I can tell you, in uh, medical doctors, we have 61% females medical doctors. And so Omani women are everywhere to the degree that Sultan Qaboos University, where I work, um, we have a quota system for males. Oh, really? Yes, because if it's, if we just, if it's all only open, female bring higher grades. So it will be more females than male. So I mean, so they take 50% female, 50% male to make a balance. In that case, are you witnessing in Amman a angry pushback, if you like, from men, given the success of women, as you just mentioned? No, they are behind our success. We can't reach to any successful position or to do anything uh, without them. So I think we are working with each other. And I think because the law doesn't differentiate between men and women, for that we are successful as an Omani woman. I mean, that must be bringing about a degree of social change as a result. There is a social, social change, but the social change is more positive. It is not a negative social change. Um, you know, in our modern society now, when you have a family, you need both partners to raise children. Long time ago, female were more responsible in the houses and male were, were responsible outside of the house. Definitely, the modern families are in Oman too. And you see new generation, they are participating um, even uh, in the workforce or even in voluntary works. As you said there, the world is witnessing a gender uh, revolution. No country is immune to this. So from another generation from now, how do you think society in Oman will look as a result of this massive push towards equality? Research proves that women think differently than women, than men. I mean, they think differently. They use their brain areas of the brain differently. For that, we need for both genders together to work, to accomplish and to pursue the development that Oman is witnessing now. So I see maybe women are more uh, in more areas than they are now. Girls will have more role model and uh, that will make them to pursue their education which they do now. I mean, we don't have any gender uh, gap between male and females in basic education and even on the uh, diploma education. I think Uma, Omani women, um, after many years, I think they will be maybe participating more Especially, maybe, maybe you will see 50% in Shura Council, which is the electric council. Dr. Alawati, thank you for your time. Thank you. And finally, with the Route de Rome sailing race coming up soon and the famed Vendée Globe in 2020, British sailor Sam Davies is aiming for glory. But with a partner whom she will compete against in the transatlantic race and a seven-year-old son, we take a look at how Davies and her family combine their adventurous lifestyle with everyday life.
Sam Davies is setting her sights on the Route du Rhum in November, a transatlantic race from mainland France to Guadeloupe, in which dozens of sleep-deprived sailors travel nearly 5,000 kilometres across the ocean. Today, she's one of a few women sailing competitively at such a high level. It's a sport that's amazing because there's no division, uh, women, men, and so we're all racing together for the same result. Davies is hoping for a podium finish. To complicate things at home, her partner, Roma Atanasio, is also a professional skipper who will be competing against her in the Route du Rhum. And that means calling Sam's parents to come take care of their son, Ruben. When I go out to sea, I do so because it's my job and her too, and we feel no guilt. The only thing is that we have to take care of a seven-year-old boy. But living with your opponents can also have some advantages. When you're preparing a race, and a single-handed race especially, um, there's not, not so many people uh, who really understand what's going on to talk to. So I guess we're in a nice position in that way where we can actually exchange quite a lot of uh, our ideas and use each other to, um, uh, to get better together. Life inside a race boat can be extremely challenging. The ride is rough and wet, sometimes for months on end. And sailors rarely sleep more than 90 minutes at a time, often settling for 20-minute naps whenever they can. To be honest, sometimes I feel really guilty because I don't think much about home. Uh, sometimes I even forget I'm a mum. Racing this kind of boat is so full on that you have to put all your energy into, um, into sailing fast. Sam Davies is just one of three women competing in her class and will be taking part in the Vendée Globe Round the World Yacht Race in 2020. And that's it for now. You can also connect with us via our Facebook page, that of course being France24.51%, or do send us a tweet at underscore 51%. So until our next show, bye for now.